over my older brother and my older sister. How's that? If you were born in the territory of Alaska, you're not eligible to run for president. Oh. I was born in the state of Washington. <laughs> I've been eligible all my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, and have you run? No. <laughs> I'm too old now. Okay. <laughs> if there ever were a time. All right. Which I'm sure there wasn't. <laughs> so we're rolling? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Um, I'm Katie Bosler, and for our preliminaries for the Veterans History Project, um, it's May 25th, 2007. We're at the uh, home of Tom Stewart. Oh. Okay. Does that... How's that? It's down below that we see it. Let's see. No. Okay. Where do you, where do you want it? Trail. I have a picture of the house with a big stump right in the middle of what's now the street. But it's sheltered from the wind. The woods behind it and the hill keep the wind, the, the winter winds, the taco winds from from hitting it, mm -hmm. uh, it's close to town. Nice. Okay, all right, so one more time. It's May 25th, 2007, Juneau, Alaska. We're in the home of Judge Tom Stewart, um, the home where he uh, was grew up and was brought up. Uh, it's been in his family since 1916. Um, Tom Stewart was born on January 1st, 1919, and uh, the names of the people who are here, including the camera operators, are Diane Martin, John Kelly, and Jim Mahan. I'm Katie Bosler. And first, uh, preliminaries, uh, should I tell, tell, call, it, call you Judge Stewart, Tom Stewart, Tom? What do you feel comfortable with? Should I t call you Judge Stewart, Tom? Just Tom is fine. Tom is fine. Okay. Tom, can you tell me, um, the, you were in World War II. What was your branch of service? The Army. The Army. Actually, it was... The, what was called the Army of the United States. Those were people that were inducted under the uh, Draft Act. And what was your rank? Well, for a year I was a buck private. And then in, uh, in the late winter of 1942, I, I, I entered the Army and in the end of March 1941, which was six or eight months before Pearl Harbor. 1942, uh, I went to Fort Benning for the officer candidate training. And I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in um, June of 1942. And I was promoted to first lieutenant and was promoted to captain and my military service was mostly as a captain. I mean, my battle service. And you served in? Well, I was in something called the 87th Mountain Infantry. And when I joined it, it was called the 87th Mountain Infantry 1st Battalion Reinforced. It was the, it was the beginning of, of what eventually became the 10th Mountain Division. Uh, and it was commonly known as the ski troops, but that was a misnomer because we were, although we had ski training, we basically were trained to operate in the mountains off the road system. So you were you were in the f very first regiment of what became three regiments of the 10th Mountain Division. Three regiments. And uh, I was in the 87th, first battalion. And the 2nd and 3rd Battalions were formed after I arrived, and eventually they cadred the 86th and then the 85th. So they, numerically they were formed in reverse order, first the 87th, then the 86th, and the 85th. Now the 10th Mountain Division is credited with paving the way for the ultimate Allied victory in Italy. If you, if you limit it to Italy, yes. 
I'd like to clarify, in my view, America didn't win the war. It was the Russians. There were two million Americans killed in the war. There were 20 million Russians killed. And Hitler's ill-fated attempt, which was called Barbarossa, Barbarossa was the name of a famous German general two or three centuries before. Barbarossa was Hitler's attempt to go to Moscow and Leningrad and, and take over Russia. But he had the same fate as Napoleon did. They couldn't handle the cold weather. They weren't prepared for it adequately. And the Russians began the, the defeat of the Germans at uh, a town, a city called Stalingrad, where they defeated the Third German Army, wiped them out virtually. And uh, so. Uh, so by the time I, you were in Italy, that had already occurred? That had all occurred in 1953. 19. I mean, 43. 43. 43. Yeah. The, the Russians were on the march, <laughs> they were headed for Germany. So, and so. The Germans couldn't stop them. And the Germans were already depleted, their troops, by, yeah. by the Russians. But as far as the Italian campaign was concerned, twice the Americans, the Americans had taken up beyond uh, uh, Rome. They'd come to the North Apennines. The Germans had um, primarily, with some help from the remaining Italians still fighting with them, fortified the North Apennines, created what was called the Gothic Line, which was heavily fortified. The Americans, twice before we got there in 1944, attempted to break through the Gothic Line and failed. We got there in January of 1945, and in February, March, and April, we broke the Gothic Line, went through the Gothic Line, crossed the Po Valley. My battalion was the first one to cross the Po River. And we went up the east shore of a, a feature called Lake Garda, Lago de Garda. And the, the, the war ended when we were at the north end of Lake Garda. And how did you do it? How did you break through where other uh, troops before you hadn't been able to accomplish this feat? The genius of our commanding general. Who was? His name was George Hayes, H-A-Y-S. And he was a fine soldier. He won the Congressional Medal of Honor in World War I. Uh, and um, uh, we, we broke through the German lines and rushed across the south side of the Po Valley with 250,000 Germans behind us. And what was the strategy? What was the difference? Our mission was to cut off the German supply line to go to the Brenner Pass and, and prevent the Germans from coming into Italy or from getting out, cutting off their supply. Uh, and what happened uh, at the pole, uh, my regiment arrived there, my battalion really, about three o'clock in the morning, uh, late in April. Uh, the regimental commander, who was a, a full colonel named Colonel David Fowler, went to, and also I think the battalion commander, uh, his name was Ross Wilson, uh, he was a lieutenant colonel, went to a meeting and came back and said, we're going to cross the river the following day, 36 hours later. So the colonel and I bedded down behind the big dike, which is about 40 feet high and a huge dike. And I woke up about 7 in the morning and... Um, 
stuff dirty and grimy, so I boiled some water, shaved my face, and about the time I got cleaned up, a jeep with two stars came driving up the road about uh, 50 yards above me. And I knew that was General Hayes. I knew him personally because his son had been a lieutenant in our battalion and he was slightly wounded and I had to call his father and tell him that, that he'd been wounded but that he was okay. Um, anyhow, I rushed up and gave the general a salute at, at his jeep. Ordinarily, when we made an advance each day, we would get a, a mimeographed sheet giving us our orders. Today, your your uh, aim is to take Hill 937 or whatever. That not, didn't happen. The general said, Stuart, where's Wilson? He said, he's right there, sir, asleep. I'll wake him up and he'll be up here in a couple of minutes. And Wilson was? Colonel Wilson, the battalion commander. Okay. And so... I went down and shook his shoulder and said, the general wants to see you right now. So he and I went up to the car, and the general said to him, Wilson, God damn it, cross the river. <laughs> <laughs> that was the whole order. <laughs> no, no, nothing in writing. And the general, that was the strategy. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the colonel said, yes, sir, but the, where are the boats? The general said, I'll get the boats. And uh, about six or eight years ago, his son and wife came and stayed with me for a week. And he said, my father didn't have any orders from the Corps commander, whose name was Crittenberger, Lieutenant General, to get the boats. He just went back to the quartermaster, and of course he was the senior officer present. I want the boats now. So th I took them until noon to get the boats up, lined up on the bank of the river. Starting at 3 a.m.? No, 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 yeah. no. This was now 8 in the morning. Okay, all right. And then he went back and got the boats. So it was 9 or 10, and it was noon by the time. The, the boats were 8-man boats. I mean, 11-man boats. Three engineers that paddled them. They didn't have engines. They were, they were uh, rowboats. Uh, and then a squad of 8 men. And they... Uh, the engineers got the, the boats down on the edge of the water, and our t two of our rifle companies and our uh, our headquarters, I mean our weapons company, lay down on the top of the dike. Unfortunately, the Germans, while they didn't have any organized defense, did have anti-aircraft guns on the north side of the river, and those those guns had what you call VT fuses variable time fuses. They, they would estimate the range to the target and set the time for the shell to explode. They, their observers on the other side of the river saw us settling on the top of that dike, our troops. And about five minutes before 12, when we were supposed to take off, they raked the top of that. Like that, we had 60 casualties. Some killed, some just wounded. But so you, you saw people just perish before your eyes. Yes. What was, what was that like? We were in the middle of war. <laughs> it happened a lot. Anyhow, they got into the, into the boats and crossed the river. And... Uh, just to give you the sense of it, uh, I had a, another captain who was a very good friend who was in the, the, uh, the headquarters on the south side of the river. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're down in a, in a, a trench the Germans had dug. And uh, Crittenberger came, and he and General Hayes had been classmates at, at uh, West Point many, many years earlier. And Crittenberg, according to my friend, Crittenberger said to him, George, where in the hell do you think you're going? Because he didn't have any orders from a uh, corps to cross the river. And Hayes looked at him and said, you want me to bring him back? 
they had already taken the other side of the river. He knew that the quicker we got there, the less chance the Germans would have to, to set up a defense on the other side of the river. And, uh, and they didn't really have a defense there. They had a little machine gun position, but all these troops coming across in the boats, mm -hmm. they got the heck out of there. So he had he had a geographical sensibility yeah. there. It's interesting. Tactical sense. And it's interesting that this involved boats because the 10th Mountain Division is known for mountaineering skills um, and, and skiing skills. Um, well, we had been in the mountains in, in the North Apennines. Right, and, and were you at all involved with um, the, uh, the, the, um, the, in, the situation with Mount Belvedere in Reba Ridge? Very much so. Tell us about that. Now, this, this was Mount Belvedere, Reba, Reba Ridge. That was around February of 1945? Yes. Mount Belvedere was our first major goal. And um, as I told you, the Americans had twice captured Belvedere, and the Germans had counterattacked and driven them off. They had a strong defense on the top of Mount Belvedere which is not a steep mountain. It's not like Mount Juno. It's a slope about like that. Uh, and there's a, a road that went up there, which was mined. One of our vehicles mm -hmm. went over a mine, and that was the end of the use of the road. So this is more of a kind of rolling hills area north of Florence. Yeah. Um, and we, uh, we captured the top of the mountain. It's a kind of a... And how did you do that? Difficult moment uh, uh, when we were in that process. I was uh, the battalion adjutant, and my function was for my company, the headquarters company, to provide perimeter defense for the battalion headquarters, and uh, and to provide communications for the colonel, the battalion commander, to communicate with the, each of the company headquarters. And uh, right at that time, we, we took the top of Mount Belvedere. Uh, the 87th took the, the west end of it, uh, and uh, the 85th took the east end of it. So did you sneak up on the Germans in the middle of the night? No, we, we, we came uh, in daylight in the, in the morning. But it was possible for us to do that because Hayes, being the the great general that he was, had flown over the area a couple of days before and determined that what we had to do was to take out Reaver Ridge. Here's Mount Belvedere, and, and it, on either side of it there was a road that led into the Po Valley, and the Germans were desperate to keep us from taking those roads. Well, Hayes flew over and recognized that Reaver Ridge, which was higher than uh, than Belvedere and was off to the west from Belvedere was occupied by the Germans and they had perfect view a perfect view of the face of Mount Belvedere and from their position they could radio to the people on top exactly what was happening on Belvedere and he knew that it was necessary to eliminate that and we had uh, some expert climbers, some Swiss guides that had climbed in the Alps and uh, our own people that had climbed in uh, the mountains around uh, Seattle. So the Americans were working with the Swiss for this operation? No, no, these were, these were uh, individuals that had come from Switzerland but were in our regiment. They were members of our regiment. But they were expert rope climbers. They climbed Reaver Ridge, which has a steep cliff face. It drops off easily on the back side, but the, that just steep cliff face, the Germans considered to be unusable. So unbeknownst to the Germans? Unbeknownst to the Germans, in the middle of the night, our expert climbers went up four routes on that cliff face and put in fixed ropes, and the whole battalion uh, of uh, uh, another battalion than mine went up that cliff face at nighttime. 
So you were one of those people going up the road. I've gone to the top of it at 5 o'clock in the morning. The Germans were all asleep and either killed or captured the whole German force on top of Riva Ridge. And therefore, the Germans no longer had the observation of Belvedere that was critical to their defense of Belvedere. And, and that was a pretty brutal operation, killing the Germans up there? Well, yes. I don't, I don't know what the casualty rate was. Uh, it was not my company that was on that mountain. Uh, I was very familiar with the mountain. And long after the war was over, I was there and, and, and got up on top of Reaver Ridge and saw what the Germans had been able to view of the Belvedere operation. But, but basically cut out the German viewpoint, cut out so, the German so, opportunity to view, so that when we did go up Belvedere, the ones who were on top didn't have the benefit of the communications from River Ridge about what was happening below them. So did you personally kill Germans up there? Did you take prisoners? Well, our, our, our unit did. I didn't personally. But you were one of the people who went you were up I, there. I, I was, yes. Yeah. Surrounding the area. No. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so th it sounds like this was pr pretty uh, um, difficult fighting. I mean, of, of the 10,000 10 Mountain Division troops, half were wounded, 1,000 were killed. Um, 4,000 wounded. 4,000 wounded. That was over the period from January to May. Of 1945? Yeah. So what was that like for you? I mean, how, how did you deal with losing your comrades or seeing them badly wounded? That was our mission. Did you have any close calls yourself? That I what? Any close calls yourself? Yes, I did. Um, uh, later when we got to the Po River um, and, the, German, and uh, the general had given the order to cross the river. The Germans had an eight foot deep well dug trench behind the dike and they, they moved uh, in that trench. Well, we did too. I, I, I was in the, not the first wave. The first wave was three rifle companies. A, B, and C, and uh, and some of the weapons company, which was D Company of the 1st Battalion of the 87th. They were in the first move across the river. And then the headquarters company and the reserve company, uh, I think it was, that was probably C, I think A, B, and, and weapons went across first, and then the next wave was... Uh, C Company, which had been in reserve, and headquarters company. Well, I got up on top of the dike. My company was all down in that trench behind the dike. And the Germans were, uh, well, I could see that the boats, the current of the river had taken them downstream. And when they were coming back, the current took them further downstream. So I was in the position of telling my company when to get out of the trench to get into the boats, which was two or three hundred yards downstream from where we had approached it. So I was up on the top of the dike, and they were firing this deflected and aircraft fire at me because I was the only one up on the top of the dike. Oh, and all they, by yourself there. Yeah. Just a, but, a standing and, and duck. The, huh? And the battalion executive officer, who was a major, was down in the trench. And he yelled at me, he said, Stuart, get down off there. I said, I can't. I have to see where the boats are in order to tell the company where to go. You're I'm yelling this at him. Down in the <laughs> trench, I couldn't see it. So, But they, the shell bursts of this, this deflected anti-aircraft fire um, took place um, about every minute and a half. And so in that 
lull, I ran on the top of the dike. And then anticipating that the shells were going to come, I hit the ground. And the shrapnel spit in around me. <laughs> so you're, you're doing this every 90 seconds for how long? Oh, I don't know, four or five minutes. Probably. Oh, my gosh. Ten minutes, maybe. What an experience. <laughs> Talk about well, an I was, adrenaline rush. I was rush. lucky because the, the shrapnel came in all around me, but I never got hit. Were you, were, you, were you shaken for a few days after that? <laughs> no, no, no. We, I was a bit too busy. We got across the river, and across the river there was an, an orchard, and uh, the Germans knew that we were in that orchard, and so they aimed all their fire at that orchard area, and um, uh, the fire was coming in close. Shells were exploding very close, there was a hole about as big as that table, and it was about six feet deep. And when a shell came in close, I dove into that hole, and I landed right on top of our commander, our, our uh, current bird colonel, who was the regimental commander, and his driver. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Did so they say, I, Stuart, I, what are you doing here? <laughs> and it, went, it, it led up for a little bit, and I got out. And one of my best soldiers was a man named Hollister Kent. He was a nephew of Atwater Kent, who made the Atwater Kent radios in the, in the 30s. And uh, he was a sergeant. He was my communication sergeant. And he and his platoon strung uh, twisted wire for telephones from the, from the battalion headquarters out to the company headquarters so the colonel could talk with him. Uh, secure. Well, uh, he the shells were coming back in, and he and I were lying in a ditch, and my his feet were this way, and my head was right there, and a shell came in the tree right above us, and he gave a yelp, and um, uh, if, it, if the shell had had hit a couple of feet further, it would have gone in my head. But um, he gave a yelp, and uh, a piece of shrapnel had almost severed his wrist, and he was having a arterial bleeding spurting out of the wound in his wrist. And so I uh, put a tourniquet on his arm to sew that down and wrapped the wrist with a compressed bandage. Uh, uh, but then I had to move because my company was on the move, and. Um, so I tagged him for the medics and took off. But it was a pretty close call. Did he make it? Yeah, I saw him about two years later. He, I was at law school at Yale, and um, he came to the hospital there to, for a, a surgical job to rebuild his wrist to make it work. And, and uh, I knew he was in the hospital, so we got together and we, uh, we double dated. He dated a nurse, and I dated another nurse. And he married his nurse, but I didn't <laughs> marry the one. <laughs> Anyhow, um, well, it sounds, I got, uh, sounds like a happy ending for both of you in any I case. When I was on top of that dike mm -hmm. to determine where the, tell my company to get up to come to the boats, uh, I got a silver star for that. And tell us about being awarded the Silver Star. When was that, and, and what was the feeling for you? Well, it was unexpected, you know. I had nothing to do with the decision to make that award. I had a couple of bronze stars, but uh, uh, this was higher. Uh, that, that, that is... They, they, yeah. they, the regiment, I mean the division, was assembled on a parade ground after the surrender. And uh, the general was there to hand me the, to pin the medal on there. That must have been quite a moment for you. <laughs> now, you also have a story about towards the end of the war, a luger being handed to you. The what? A luger, a gun being handed to you for protection. No. 
there it is. I thought you might want to see it. Yeah. I won't aim it at you. <laughs> there are no, no bullets in it. That's a German Luger. And how did this come into your possession? Well, at the surrender, we were at the at the end of Lake Garda, which is a long lake. It's about uh, it's about ninety miles long, I think. And at the upper end of it, there's steep cliffs that come into the water. And the and the, there was a road that the Italians had built before the war, but because of where these ridges came down uh, in, into the water, it's sort of like Turner Lake. You ever been in Turner Lake? No. Up in the, you ought to go there. It's a beautiful place. Um, the Germans, there were tunnels where the ridges came down. Probably half a dozen tunnels or four or five. And they set up their defense in the mouths of those tunnels to the south. Well, we had ducks. You don't know what a duck is. Not, not a, I, this is a euphemism. This is a two and a half ton truck. <laughs> okay. Built with a boat body surrounding the, the, the engine and um, propellers. And they could drive off the beach into the, into the lake. And each duck would hold a, about a platoon, which is about 30, 32 men. And so, in the middle of the night, we loaded up two or three companies, and they went up to the head, and came back down the lake at the, at the upper end of the tunnels where they weren't defended, and wiped out the German defendants. And that that was the final straw. That of... was the final straw. The the battle ended at the end of Lake Garda. I can't remember the name of the town on the on the northwest end of it. The next day. The major who was the operations officer for the division, no, for the regiment, I guess, and I, and a jeep driver, and a German-speaking German-Jewish soldier who was a member of our company but spoke fluent German, we were designated to go to the next town up, the sh up towards the Brenner Pass. Uh, which was about 10 kilometers beyond the head of the lake. And to go to the headquarters and talk with the German commander for the area to determine a place for us to bivouac, to bring the regiment and set up a camp, a good land for it. And... Um, so the Germans have surrendered, and now this is your, this your is next This is the day mission. after the surrender. Right, right. Uh, and it, was, it was a spooky situation. There were four of us in this American Jeep. We drove into Rovereto, and there were 3,000 armed Germans moving up and down that street. Not very happy about the Americans. <laughs> it, it was No doubt. It was spooky. And yeah, we got to, to uh, the German uh, translator got directions to the villa on the n north side of the town where the colonel was, and the German colonel in command of the area. And uh, I and the driver stayed in the jeep, and the, the major, uh, his name is Halvor Eckern, Hal Eckern, and the uh, translator went into the villa. Part of the terms of the surrender was that all the officers had to give up their handguns. Show us that one more time. Yeah. So all the officers had to give up give their handguns. Pardon? All the officers had to give up their ha their handguns, the German officers. So he got about 30 or 40 handguns and brought, brought them and put them in the Jeep. This is the, the best one, uh, the Luger. Um, they had Italian Berettas, and there's another handgun that the officers used. But uh, the, the terms of the 
surrender specifically said that they had to surrender their handguns to avoid confrontation. So that's quite a souvenir. And so um, <laughs> uh, the uh, this major and his man brought these handguns and put them in the in the back of the jeep, and I took that one. And you still have it as a uh, a token of your. Uh amazing story really so so that was that was um italy um the war ends that must have been uh was it a jubilant moment uh, after the scary part well yes it was but uh uh they had the, they didn't have the shipping to take thousands of soldiers back to, to America after the surrender. It took a long time to arrange that. But we had another mission assigned to us. I, I, I wasn't privy to what was happening, but I, what I was told was that Churchill was very concerned that Tito, with the Yugoslavs, would, The president of Yugoslavia. Would President of Yugoslavia would attempt to cross uh, the Isonzo River. The Isonzo River formed the border between Italy and Yugoslavia, north of Venice. And so we were assigned to go down to that area, which is called Venezia Giulia, and prevent that from happening. There was a bridge, several bridges across the river, and I remember one in our sector. That my troops were on the on the west side of the bridge, and the Yugoslavs were across the river, which was not nearly as large as the Po River. It was a good sized river, but but uh, we were there to keep the uh, Yugoslavs from coming across, because that area of Venezia Giulia, which is sort of elliptical. And I would say it was uh, 30, 40 kilometers long, had been Yugoslavia. And the village that was our headquarters was, was called Plezzo, P L E Z Z O, by the Italians. But the people in it were Yugoslavs. And I went back there with Bud Carpenetti, the uh, of the Supreme Court, he and I are good friends, and he wanted us. He wanted me to go with him and show him where the battles had taken place in northern Italy. So we made a trip over there about six or eight years ago, and that town is now called Bovec. Now, did you see any battle there, any action, or was it more just a, this a is precaution? After the surrender. Right. So it was more of a precautionary. It was precautionary mission. to keep them. Actually, um, my personal situation uh, was kind of unusual. The Army had a policy to determine the priority of individuals to go back home. It was a numbering system. It was a numbering system. You got one point for each month of service in America and two points for each month of service overseas. Well, I was in Alaska. So I was overseas when I was in Washington, <laughs> Oregon, California. Because Alaska was a territory. Wisconsin, <laughs> Massachusetts. <laughs> I got two points for all my time in the continental United States. But when we went out to Kisco and the Aleutians, that was Alaska. I only got one point and all the other soldiers got two points. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> because I, they, they, they were overseas, but I wasn't. I was home. <laughs> oh, okay. But then, anyhow. The, so did it I, take I you longer to get home? A lot of time in training, all the time in Colorado and Camp Hale. And, and I did, uh, did cross-country skiing and winter camping uh, assignments uh, during the war in uh, Wisconsin and in Massachusetts and in New Hampshire. Uh, and um, 
So you racked up enough points. So I racked up a lot of points. So I, I to get a discharge. I and the oh. colonel who had been in for a long time, a battalion commander, my, my battalion commander, got orders one day to uh, fly to um, um, Florence, not Florence. Uh, the, the, Was it the, Naples? The city south of Rome. Uh, Pisa. Pardon? No. Anyway. I, I, I can't remember the name of it just at the moment. I'll think of it. It's a well-known place. Uh, but um, that's where we landed when we came from the, United, from the United States originally. You ended up in Naples. Naples, that's right, Naples. Uh, we were ordered to fly to Naples, and we thought maybe we were going to be on a plane to New York maybe the next day, the colonel and I. We got to Naples and they herded us into a, to a, a bleacher for an old racetrack. And there was a tough old master sergeant. There probably were uh, 1,500, 2,000 people like ourselves. They were up in the bleachers. And the sergeant said, gentlemen, relax. You will be notified when you're turn to go home comes when the ship comes you're assigned a ship and it may be two or three months <laughs> <laughs> so I was there for, in Naples for two months so you got to enjoy Italy a little bit I climbed Mount Vesuvius I went to Pompeii saw all the pornographic paintings that the Italians had in Pompeii had been uncovered after the uh, Vesuvius eruption. This is an, an, an archaeological there, there, there uh, find. Were, there were a lot of uh, attractive American nurses that we dated <laughs> and, ha and had a nice time and finally got home in um, August of 45. So you, you in had. In the meantime, my regiment went home as a group about a, three weeks before we did. But you got to stick around and have some fun, it sounds yeah. like. Now, I, I want to hear more about your training at the 10th Mountain Division, but before we get to that, before you went over to Europe, you were in the Aleutians. That's right. You, you, were, you were in Alaska. <coughs> what happened there was... You, you took uh, marine assault training. Pardon? You, you took marine assault training to go to the Aleutians. No, no, that was not training. Oh, I mean, before you went to the Aleutians, you were in California training for it? As a private, I took my basic training in March, April, May into June of 1941, which was six or eight months before Pearl Harbor, before America entered the war. I had uh, received my bachelor's degree from the University of Washington in late March of 41, and uh, I, had a, I had an exemption from the draft by reason of being a college student. And if I'd gone on to graduate school then, uh, the exemption would have been good until, until Pearl Harbor happened, then the, oh, that exemption was wiped out. Anyhow. Uh, but there, there was a draft well before Pearl Harbor. The draft was in October of 1940. And the men who were in the initial draft had a saying, Ohio, over the hill in October. So October 40, they were drafted, and they figured in October 41, they would get out, or they would go over the hill. <laughs> well, and of course, the, the, the situation with Japan heated up. And, uh, and the, the situation in Germany heated up. Uh, Roosevelt sold the destroyers to the British to help contain the German uh, submarine threat in the Atlantic, but, uh, but the, the war was getting closer all the time. Um, so you saw the writing on the wall? Yeah. Uh, well, what, what happened was the last two years of my college experience, I became an active skier. I spent, my grade average went down 
because I spent every weekend at Mount Baker. <laughs> and I had become a ski teacher. I had passed an exam as a ski teacher given by the Pacific Northwest Ski Association. And you were going to school at what? University of Washington. University of Washington, right there in Bellingham. No, no, no. Seattle. Okay. Belling Bellingham is, uh, is, is part of the Oh, right. Okay. University school system, but the main University of Washington campus is in Seattle. Okay. And they offered Alaskans... Bellingham's a little closer to Baker, that's what I was thinking about. Anyway. They offered uh, Alaskans uh, the opportunity to go to, the, to school in, in, at the University of Washington uh, and also Washington State um, on the same terms as if we were residents of Washington. So uh, the, yeah. the tuition was much reduced, it was cheaper from Juneau to go to Seattle and get a better school than it was to go to Fairbanks and go to the Alaska Agricultural College and School of Mines. Both of my older brothers went there. Yeah, they offer the same kind of program now. Pardon? They offer the same kind of program now. Well, they, yeah. They're still offering yeah. it now. Mm -hmm. Well, anyhow, uh, I uh, did that, but then when I got my degree, I had a friend who was driving to Sun Valley, so I bought a return trip ticket on the train. And I drove to Sun Valley with him, and he was going on beyond. And I stayed in Sun Valley until I had 10 cents left. And then I got on the train, went to Seattle, walked up the street from the train station. It must have been good skiing took, if you stayed oh, in Sun Valley until you had 10 skiing. cents left. Excellent skiing. <laughs> and I had friends who were teaching skiing there. And uh, they, they were offered college weeks for $35 uh, a month. College a week, weeks. $35 a week. You got a room, a, a bed in the Challenger Inn, meals in the cafeteria, ski lift tickets, and ski lessons for $35 a week. I can afford that. So that's how you learned to ski? No, I learned to ski here. There was a there was a German fellow and an Austrian fellow, both of whom had been trained in the Hannes Schneider School in Austria. They were fine skiers. And uh, they right were, here in they were uh, working at Sun Valley. And Norman Banfield, who was a lawyer here, and Curtis Shattuck, who was in the uh, had the insurance company, uh, they had money, relatively to, to me, um, and they went to Sun Valley for the when it was uh, shortly after it was opened in '36, and they met these two fellows who uh, were illegally in America. They had escaped from Germany and avoided Hitler. And they were teaching, they were part-time ski instructors at Sun Valley. They taught skiing in the day and waited, waited tables at night in the Challenger Inn. But Amazing. They were, they were what running, a way to, uh, to uh, escape uh, the war. They were running from the immigration service because they were illegally in America. And they, and, uh, they met Kurt and Norm Banfield and, who said, why don't you come to Juneau? We can get you a job in Juneau. So they did, and a fellow named Walter Scott, who was my roommate at, at the college, uh, his father was the superintendent of the Alaska Juno Mill. Uh, he and I both came home, and we we spent uh, the fall, winter, spring of uh, 37, 38, and the summer of 38, working for the Alaska Juno. And um, uh, the mine. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, we we worked in the mill. Unfortunately, uh, he was he was uh, painting one of the big oil tanks on the hill above Lower Front Street. I think the remnants of them may still be there. Uh, he and his uh, the, the chief painter for the uh, for the mill crew were painting, and they had a. Uh, platform that they had, had hooks on top of the tank. They hoisted them up, themselves up, 
and his hook came loose and the platform dropped and he landed on his head and it killed him. And he was my roommate, one of my closest friends. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Well, but anyhow, uh, I went to Sun Valley and I stayed until I had the 10 cents left and I came back and walked up the street to the draft office and said, here I am. I, I could have gone back to school and continued the exemption for another few months. And, and why did you choose to walk into that draft office and say, here I am? Because I want to get my year over. Because you, you, you thought it would be year. October to October and that I, would be it. I, I want to get my year over. When the draft originally set up, you, you had to spend a year in the military service, and I wanted to get that year over. But uh, once I was in, uh, in the fall, Pearl Harbor came, and, and, that, and that program was out. And then at that point, you realized, okay, if I'm going to be in the service, well, I want to figure out a way to ski and be in the service? Yes. And how did you do Here's that? Here's what happened. After I finished the basic training at Fort Lewis, in Tacoma, south of Tacoma, I read a newspaper article that General Simon Bolivar Buckner, who was the commanding officer for all of Alaska, was going to set up a skiing operation for soldiers at McKinley Park. And I knew that my father was well acquainted with him because my father was the head of the mining industry for the territory of Alaska for 30 years, from 1919 to 1949. And uh, so I wrote him a letter, Dear General Buckner, uh, uh, my name is Tom Stewart, I think you know my father, B.D. Stewart, the mine inspector. Uh, I'm a certified ski instructor and I would like to be considered to teach skiing at the development that you're planning in McKinley Park. I got a very nice letter back, Dear Private Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still have the letter? Somewhere. <laughs> um, I'd be delighted to have you. However, you are in General DeWitt's command. General DeWitt was the commander for the troops on the Pacific Coast, up and down the Pacific Coast. You are in General DeWitt's command. You get yourself to Alaska into my command, and then we can consider it further. Well, about that time, there was a, a notice on my bulletin board in my company that I was took the training with. And so at that point, when he wrote you the letter, where were you? In Seattle. You're in Seattle, okay. Well, I, was, I was at Fort Lewis. Fort Lewis, okay. I was, yeah. Fort, I was a private at Fort Lewis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, there was this notice on my bulletin board that volunteers wanted to go to Alaska. So I turned out at the appointed time, and there was a, a major. That was kind of a no-brainer for you, right? Pardon? <laughs> no-brainer for you? You're from Alaska? <laughs> He didn't know it up to that point, uh, but he was a major from what was known as the West by God, Virginia National Guard. Emphasis on the by God. Yes. As far as those soldiers were concerned, they were hillbillies from the mountains of West Virginia. Uneducated. Many of them had not gone to school at all, couldn't read and write. But he was uh, a major, and he was educated, and he had been a coal miner. He had been involved with coal mining in, in West Virginia. And I was able to tell him about coal mining in Alaska, about which I knew vicariously from my father. I could tell him where the coal was and so forth. My father had persuaded General Buckner to power the military bases being built at Elmendorf and Fort Richardson with coal-fired steam plants because oil was in terribly short supply. Shipping for oil was even worse. They were losing tankers in the, in the Atlantic to the Germans, submarines, and um, uh, it was difficult to think that they could power the bases with, a, with oil. So he persuaded them there's coal at, at Mount Nuska, the Mount Nuska coal fields. And there's coal, lots of coal at Healy River, uh, just north of the park. Both coal fields are on the railroad, so the railroad could haul coal readily. And that's what they did. They built the, the electric power generating plants with coal-fired steam plants, and they still they still operate at at uh, Elmendorf and Richardson and Lad Field. 
Anyhow, um, I could tell this major about coal mining, and he was interested. So that was your connection? That was the connection. So the, the three, coal mining connection. Three of us were, were chosen to make the trip to Alaska. Out of how many people? Any idea? I don't know how many showed up there, but but there was a sergeant and a corporal and Buck Private Stewart. <laughs> and uh, um, the mission was, there was a little old freighter sailing out of Tacoma for Sitka. The 211th Infantry, which was the West Virginia National Guard, had a battalion at, at uh, Dutch Harbor defending the shores against possible Japanese attack another battalion at Kodiak where they were building a, a, a naval air base and they were building a naval air station on Japonsky Island at Sitka. And, um, and it was being defended by the 3rd Battalion of the 211th Infantry, the West Virginia National Guard. And, and this is in this is, this is 1942? The, the summer of 41, Okay. before Pearl Harbor. Okay. And, and so, I, and so, it looks uh, we, like we, we, we yeah. took this ship. It, it was an, a, a little old freighter that had a secret shipment on board, stowed in the forward hold in the bow. So the three of us stood guard on that secret shipment, uh, uh, four on, four hours on and eight hours off around the clock on the bow of that ship. We went outside. We didn't go up the inside passage. We went out about 40 miles offshore in the open Pacific. And it was a big storm. The ship made four knots an hour. It took us 14 days to go from Tacoma to Sitka. We rolled 40 degrees. Uh, and the only access to that secret shipment was in the hatch cover in the forward. No, nobody was able to get in that way. But we stood guard there. And you later found out what was in that secret shipment. Many years later, I found out it was the first radar machine being sent to Alaska. It was set up on the on Harbor Mountain behind Sitka to observe whatever airplanes were in the sky offshore from Sitka. And I think that's a good stopping point for this tape. Yeah. Okay. Um, Uh, do well, you want to take a little break or? Uh, Pardon? Did you want to, you want to take a little break? I, I mean, I know we've got. I'm fine. I think uh, Judge Stewart's okay if you guys are. Okay. So, um, let's see. So now, um. I'm in Sitka as a casual. You're in.